the simple answer is that a placebo is a fake treatment, a fake a sugar pill, a saline injection, or f a fake dummy procedure, surgery even, uh, that's used to control um, an active intervention in a randomized control trial. And you say a placebo effect is the effect that you see in a randomized control trial in the placebo arm. That's probably accurate enough, but actually that's not what I study. What I, I think placebo is a surrogate marker or a, um, it's not the sugar pill that does anything, it's everything that envelops the sugar pill. And the sugar pill is embedded in the provision of care. It's the study of placebo effects is what does the provision of care give patients if there's no active pharmacology or active procedures. It's what does the ritual of medicine provide people. And in a broad sense, it's the doctor-patient relationship, it's, the, um, it's compassion, trust, and hope. It's all the things that we say are nonspecific. In placebo studies, we make them specific and say, let's look at things in healthcare that are not just the drugs, not just the procedures, not just the surgery. And uh, that's what placebo studies is. Placebo studies is also means it's not it's not a, it's a it's a field it's emergent field. It's not many people do this, um, and it means and we use the word placebo studies because we study the clinical phenomena. What, what does the ritual of medicine do for people? Uh, what does just taking care of someone do? We study the scientific basic science questions. What's the neurobiology? What's the neuro circuitry of, of, of people getting benefits from the ritual of treatment. We also study um, the anthropology, the sociology. We study uh, the history, study philosophic questions. It's, um, we define placebo studies as a multidisciplinary initiative and try to understand what usually is considered intangible in medicine to make it tangible. I, you know, what we've done several studies, we try to tease apart uh, what, uh, what the components of the placebo effect are. But clearly there are things like, uh, in terms of the doctor-patient relationship, it's attentive listening, repeating the words the patient has. It's looking at the patient, it's making connections, expressing empathy, uh, feeling connected to the patient's uh, serious questions in their lives. Uh, it's um, it's uh, expressions of confidence knowledge, or well, all those things are, it's touch. It's also sometimes thoughtful silence. I mean, it's very hard to uh, list a complete category of what the, um, what's the social context. That's one level. Another level is going into a sacred space or special space that's different. The hospital's different. Clinic is different. Um, it's a place that um, where people go that are, how do you say, where when we're sick, we're not part of our normal world. We get ostracized. It's a special place to bring us back to our normal world. Uh, it's, it's a very complex social place. It's a place that social context has profound impacts on people. It's a place where you talk about things you might not tell your husband or wife. It's a place where um, no matter what you say, you're usually treated with absolute respect, hopefully, and people um, are there to help you. Uh, it's, it's a very charged place. There are very few places that have as much um, charge and persuasive forces as the clinical encounter. Well, I think we're in a, obviously we're in a crisis place in, in healthcare in the United States and maybe all the Western world. Um, and I think that all the medical schools, I know Harvard Medical School, uh, also is trying to put humanism back into medicine. There's uh, the new exams for medical students are going to, uh, next two years are uh, going to switch to have more social science and psychology. There is an attempt, to, I think I'm part of a wave of how do we humanize medicine? How do we put the patient in the center of care? I think historically it's really hard for uh, medicine to put the patient in, their, in the center. Uh, we think about medicine is a science, and science puts numbers and x-rays and blood tests in, in the center, but I think that uh, tends to, at least ideologically, make that an important part of what they do. And I think uh, placebo studies is a uh, part of uh, a trend, a movement, to put the patient in the center, and not only are we dealing with 
um, drugs and procedures, we're also dealing with a human being that just being taken care of has a profound and dramatic, potentially dramatic effect on how they experience themselves, how they feel their symptoms, how they feel the well-being. In general, um, I would say the evidence suggests that placebos are for self-appraisal, symptoms that have to do with chronic pain, headache, back pain, um, knee pain, um, osteoarthritic pain, um, um, migraine headaches. These are, these are not inconsequential aspects of health. In fact, that's what brings our patients to the, uh, the healthcare provider. Um, I think the evidence that placebo shrink tumors doesn't exist. I think there's been an important study in, in the journal National Institute of, of National Institute of uh, National Cancer Institute in 2003 that made it pretty clear they've never seen any tumors shrinking with placebo controls, uh, except in situations where there'd be spontaneous remission anyways. Uh, but does, do, does the ritual of taking care of people reduce nausea, reduce pain, reduce fatigue, um, get, help, help alleviate anxiety and depression? I think that the evidence suggests that's really there. And is that important? Absolutely. Is it the only thing in healthcare? No, we need powerful drugs. We need reliable procedures. Um, but part of the transformation of medicine going on now in general is how do we humanize the situation of drugs? Where, where, where is the patient in all this? And, and my work is saying the patient's in the middle of a very compelling ritual, a very compelling um, social dynamic, and those dynamics have consequences in terms of, in some illnesses, very big consequences like depression and chronic pain. In some illnesses, they deal with the complaints associated with dramatic illnesses like cancer. AMA's uh, American Medical Association's uh, council, um, council, what do you call it, council, um, has passed a resolution saying that it's unethical to give placebos uh, with deception uh, to patients. It's obviously legal to do it in a randomized controlled trial. You inform the person, say, you may get a placebo, you may not, you may get the active ingredient. But deceit is considered unethical. But in fact, um, it looks like uh, one of my postdocs did a, a, a national survey and uh, was published in BMJ in 2008, and 50% of a national survey of U.S. physicians reported using placebos in the last year. That was much higher than we expected. Um, and what it's, most of those placebos were what we call impure placebos. They weren't necessarily uh, saline injections or sugar pills. They were vitamins that had no effect on the illness that the physician Probably, we don't know why they did it, we just didn't ask that question in the survey. A uh, physician gave them knowingly, because we asked, did you know this would have only a psychological benefit or what we call a placebo effect, and people said yes. So the question is complex because historically, from about 1772, that's the first example we have, physicians routinely gave patients in our culture placebos, but they thought they had no effect. Um, all the big hospitals in the Boston area had different kinds of sugar pills, different kinds of uh, colored uh, saline injections for injectables. And people were routinely given placebos, but they said it had no effect. It was really to deal with malingerers and nuisances and get people out of your office. Uh, they didn't talk about it much, but it was called the pious fraud or the humble humbug. What happens after World War II when people start doing randomized controlled trials and needing to talk about a placebo control is that pay, the medical community starts talking about something it calls a powerful placebo, but also says it's unethical to give people that, 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 um, these things without informing the patient. So it's a complicated thing. I think in general, um, I would say it's unethical to use deception in any clinical encounter. So I would say the ethical norm is one that we should probably uphold, which is uh, deception is inappropriate behavior. Until very recently, uh, the prevailing wisdom in healthcare has been that um, if you give a person a placebo and tell them it's a sugar pill, it won't make, uh, they, won't, they won't get a placebo effect. Um, I had reasons to think that may not be true. And because, you know, I do research, I want my research to be relevant. I, I want to make sure that it's going to 
contribute to improvements in healthcare. So in uh, 2010, that was like two years ago, um, I organized a clinical trial giving people placebo pills uh, in people with irritable bowel syndrome, which is a really difficult condition. And I randomized half of them to receive placebo pills, and they were told it was placebo. The bottom said it was placebo. We explained to them it was placebo. Um, they had to sign the informed consent and sh say it was placebo. And we gave them a rationale. We said, you know, we, don't, we know that people get better with placebos, but we don't know if they get better with placebos if they know. But we think it works maybe like Pavlov's dogs. Um, if you give, um, when Pavlov's dogs heard a bell, they would salivate. So we think that even if you don't believe it's going to work, we think it might work. And all we ask you to is take two pills twice a day for the next few weeks, and the other half of the people randomized to no treatment, stay at their regime, the way, a constant. So they had a, we had a comparison, a small study, and we got this very big placebo effect. We have to replicate it. We have to replicate it in other illnesses to find out if it's true. But right now. Um, the prevailing wisdom has been shaken. It hasn't been overthrown. And we would call that a study, a small study, a proof of concept. So, and part of the reason I did that study was um, because I wanted to see is there a way of ethically harnessing placebos uh, without deception. What do you think was the mechanism that was at play at, in that study? I think that, you know, if you, if you keep singing a song um, to yourself that of a certain kind, you eventually it becomes a part of you. And, and you know, you go to hear music, it becomes part of you. You go to church, synagogue, a mosque, it becomes, you know, even if you don't believe it, it becomes part of you. I think we were, I think that our gastrointestinal doctor, Dr. Lembo, who's a great doctor, when he gave that placebo pill and said, you're going to take it, it might work, let's see what happens, they, they, they saw Dr. Lembo twice a day. And um, I think that this, the repetition and the, uh, almost the craziness of it, had a positive effect. People were amazed, and people would say, "I can't believe it." You know, I'm getting better. And uh, so these the, people were going to the hospital to, yeah, to get the pill. Yeah, and yeah, and they would, and we followed yeah. them. And 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 uh, I think the mechanism is very complex. I think there are probably many, many mechanisms. And I'm conjecturing. We didn't do a mechanistic study. I will do a mechanistic study when we move forward with that kind of model. Um, I conjecture it's related to repetition. Um, a combination of hope and uncertainty, and just and then people probably saying, "Oh, maybe I'm a little better," and you know, maybe, and then they start focusing more, and they're getting a little better. Selective attention. Um, it's unclear for me what the mechanism wa was, but I was really happy it was a positive outcome because I would have hated to wasted all that time and got nothing. But it was, it was so. But again, I'm saying that's actually <coughs> not a very strong study yet.